If you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 13. We're going to continue in our series this morning. And uh, before we do that, um, Pat and Sharon Overly let me know that they have a friend who is in Dresden, Australia. Her name is Renee, and she watches us every week on the Internet. So I thought it'd be nice for us to, and I don't know where to look, but just it doesn't matter. At the count of three, we're going to say hi, Renee, and, and hopefully we're going to shock her in uh, Dresden, Australia this Sunday. So one, two, three, let's say hi to Renee. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, Renee. So God bless you. Isn't that good to know that people are watching all over the world? Hey, I found this. I want to give this to you before, uh, before we go to Proverbs chapter, uh, chapter 13. And I know many of you... Uh, I've seen you drive throughout Orlando, and, and, and we've got some speeders here today. And, and uh, as your pastor, I am just, uh, just really just trying to look out for you. And so I spent a lot of hours this past week uh, researching some hymns that you can sing as you are speeding. So, John, I've driven with you. You're going to need these. So um, these, are, these are hymns that as you're speeding... You can just uh, sing, and uh, this CD will be available uh, after service today in the lobby. So if you're going five miles an hour over the limit, you can sing, God will take care of me. If you are over 10 miles an hour, there's a wonderful song, a, a hymn that says, Guide me, O great Jehovah. 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, you'll start singing, Near my God to thee. At 20 miles an hour, you're singing nearer, still nearer. 25 miles an hour, you can sing, this world is not my home. 30 miles an hour, Lord, I'm coming home. And at 35 miles an hour and over, you can sing the wonderful hymn of the church, Precious Memories. <laughs> Pat, that was for you in the balcony. Pat loves telling jokes, and I thought I'd bless him with that one today. So those hymns and CD will, will be available with uh, Bruce and Lisa and myself singing all of those hymns. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 13, are you with me? Say amen. amen. We are in our year-long series on Proverbs, Wisdom for Life, and we find ourselves in chapter 13, and today we're going to talk about wise friends and who the people you surround yourself with. At the end of today's service, some of you are going to be challenged to cut off relationships that you have because they're dragging you down. They are not propelling you forward. They are not helping to bring you to the destiny and the purpose and the miracle that God has for you. Some of you today are going to be challenged to cut off those relationships and begin to seek Wise friends who are going to build you up and lift you up and speak words of life and words of healing and words of purpose and words of destiny. You see, Solomon, his name means safety, and he's trying to protect us. And he says in verse uh, 20 of Proverbs chapter 13, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. That word there, suffers harm, uh, uh, in the original language, that, that word there means destruction, suffers destruction. If you break down that original Hebrew word, it, 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 it means to screech. It means to cry at the top of your lungs. See, what happens when you surround yourself with negative people, people that are not uplifting you, people that are not wise, people that are fools, your life is a screech. Your life is screaming out, help! I'm surrounded by people that are not healthy. I'm surrounded by people that are dysfunctional. Solomon, help me to be walking with the wise so that I can become wise. And so we're going to look at an Old Testament, a New Testament story today that is going to help illustrate to us the people that we surround ourselves with. You show me the people that you surround yourself with, and I'm going to show you the person you are to become. I think some of us have relationships, and in many cases, codependent relationships. And it's safe, 
and it's comfortable, and they've been around you for all these years, and it's, it's cozy and it's safe, but those may not be the people that are going to lead you to your destiny. They will not be the people that will lead you to your miracle. You've got to be careful who you surround yourself with. The Bible says that when we walk with the wise, we become wise. And when you walk with the fools, your life is just a screeching yearning for help. Look at the top of your notes and look at a couple of these quotes that I, I, I've given you today, and I love these. Surround yourself with dreamers and the doers, the believers and the thinkers. But most, around, but, but most of all, surround yourself with those who see the greatness within you, even when you don't see it in yourself. I love that. Dreamers, doers, believers, thinkers. Surround yourself with people like that. And even when you don't see it in yourself, those people will pull that out of you. Look what C.S. Lewis said. The next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. Look around today. Oh, not right now in this service, but look around in your life <laughs> and make an assessment of who you're surrounding yourself with. C.S. Lewis says, make sure that that circle is a circle of wise men and women. Go to, uh, go to Mark chapter, chapter 2. How many are still with me this morning? Say amen. amen. I want to read a, verse, a, a, a story to you that I've, that I've preached here several years ago, and I'm going to preach it in a different way with a different slant, a different uh, uh, illustration here today. But we are going to Mark chapter 2. And we're talking about a man who has been paralyzed, unable to move. A man who, who wanted to get up and walk and he couldn't walk. He was, he was paralyzed. And many times I see Christians, I see believers that, yes, you're saved. Yes, you're going to heaven. Yes, your sins have been forgiven, but you are paralyzed. You're paralyzed mentally. You're paralyzed physically. You're paralyzed supernaturally. You are, you're, in a, you're in a zone and you're not moving forward. You're just, you're just existing. You're not moving. You're stagnant. Some would say stale, paralyzed, unable to move. And in the story in Mark chapter 2, there was a man who was in that condition, but he was unwilling to remain paralyzed. He made the decision, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life in this condition. I'm not going to spend the next 20 years of my life paralyzed. I'm not going to spend the next 10 years of my life paralyzed. I am going to watch this. I am going to surround myself with wise people. I'm going to surround myself with people who are going to speak life and health and destiny and purpose. And I'm going to surround those people because I believe in the words of Solomon that if I surround myself with wise people, I'm going to be wise. And so this paralyzed man was smart enough. He was, he was sensitive enough to realize that he had to surround himself with the right kind of people if he was going to get his miracle. And I'm telling you today, church, your miracle is determined on who you surround yourself with. People that are speaking life and purpose and faith into your spirit. Some of us surround ourselves with people that are, that are speaking doubt. They're speaking unbelief. They're not moving us forward. They're wanting to pull us back. They're wanting us to stay in that paralyzed state. And God's word for us today as a church is we do not have to remain in that paralyzed state. God wants us to move forward. He wants us to be active. He wants us to be on the go. And that is determined on who we surround ourselves with. Can I get an amen this morning? So in Mark chapter 2, let's begin at verse 1. A few days later when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there, and there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. And some men came bringing one who was paralyzed, carried by four. Circle that word, carried by four. Since they could not get in to see Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through, lowered the mat 
the paralyzed man was laying on, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to, to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now watch this in verse six. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth. And they praise God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Now, do not be mistaken by the electricity going out at this time and moment. It's just like the enemy. And we're not giving in to the enemy and the tactics of the enemy. It's not a mistake. It's not an accident that as soon as I started to read God's word, the power goes out. Open your eyes and understand the schemes of the evil one. This paralyzed man was smart enough to understand that he had to surround himself with people. He was carried by four. Everyone stick up your fingers like this and, and, and go like this to his foot. He was carried by four, not one, not two, not three, but by four. Four men, wise men, full of faith, full of vision, full of encouragement to get that paralyzed man to see Jesus. It's in your notes, and I want you to notice that the word, uh, the city that he was in, he was in Capernaum. That word there, Capernaum, means place of comfort. You see, when you surround yourself with godly people, wise people, encouraging people, you enter into a city. You enter into a place of comfort. Are y'all with me this morning? You are surrounded by people who love you, people who accept you, People who see the best in you. People who want to see your purpose and your destiny fulfilled. This paralyzed man, watch this, was, was paralyzed, unable to move, but he was going to a city called Capernaum, a place of comfort. And church, when you find godly friends, friends that, will, that you can trust in, trends, friends that you can look to, Friends that you can confide in. Friends that you can open up your heart and reveal your fears and your worries and, your, and the things that you are stressed about. When you can find friends like that and they accept you unconditionally, you walk into a zone of comfort. It's peaceful to know that you can have friends that are going to say one thing to you face to face and say the same things behind your back. You know you're not getting stabbed in the back by these friends. You know that these friends, when they speak to you, they have your best interest at heart, and they're not two-faced saying one thing and doing another thing. We need, in this life that we live in, that type of comfort to know that God will bring wise men and wise women into our life that will help to carry us to the purpose and the destiny and the miracle that God has for us. I want you to notice, church, that this paralyzed, are y'all with me this morning? This paralyzed man could not get to that miracle on his own. He could not get there by himself. He could not get there alone. He realized now that he needed some help to get him to see Jesus. And these four men were, 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 were critical 
in order to bring this man, paralyzed man, to see Jesus. And in the power of Jesus, this man's sins were not only forgiven, his body was made well and made whole. I'm afraid that some of us here today, because of our friendships and our associations, you are going to be disqualified from getting your miracle unless you are willing to cut off those relationships and surround yourself with what Solomon says, wise men and women. I don't believe this paralyzed man just randomly just went through the city and just picked anyone that was available. As we do sometimes in our relationships. I think this paralyzed man had been thinking about this for a long time. And he heard that Jesus was coming to Capernaum and he said, this is my moment. This is my destiny. This is what God wants for me to do. And he strategically picked four men to carry him to see Jesus. And if this man was so strategic in his picking of friends, how much more, church, should we be as strategic in picking the people that we are friends with on Facebook? The people that we are tweeting. The people that we are emailing. The people that we are praying with. The people that we are talking with. I hope you get this today, that you should be as strategic as this paralyzed man. Pick very carefully the people you surround yourself with. And he picked four. Now, there's nothing magical about these four, but the Bible says there was four. So I try to use the scripture as a guide for me, and I want to surround myself, as hopefully you do, men and women that are going to speak life and purpose and, and destiny into our lives. Let me, before I go there, let me give you the four obstacles that I see in this story. And it's there in your notes. How many are still with me? Say Amen. Because if you're going to fulfill God's best for you, it is not going to be an easy path. There will be obstacles. How many would agree with that? Say amen. amen. In order for you to get your miracle, there will be obstacles. And I've asked Michelle, and she's done a great job, thank you, Michelle, of placing these four chairs on the platform. These four chairs are symbolic of the obstacles that this paralyzed man faced in Mark chapter 2, but they're also very symbolic of the obstacles that you and I are going to be faced with on our way to our miracle. If you want to move, if you want to get healed, if you want to get blessed, whatever you are believing God for, you've got to surround yourself with four godly men and women, but as you are being carried to your miracle, there are going to be oppositions. There will be obstacles. There will be barriers that your friends are going to help you eliminate. The first barrier that I believe this paralyzed man was faced with, and is there in your notes, write this down, I believe it was a mental barrier or a spiritual barrier. Does God want me to get healed? Does God want me to have a purpose in this life? God, does God want to use me? Does God want me to remain paralyzed or does he want me to move forward? It was a mental, it was a spiritual barrier. And this was the hardest barrier that he had to overcome. And I believe as he was lying down there at that mat, his spirit was alive, his spirit was moving, and inside, I, 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 and on the outside, he may be unable to move, but on the inside, he was moving. And his spirit was alive. And his spirit was saying to him, God wants to heal you. God wants to make you well. God wants you to have a purpose and a destiny. So although on the outside he was paralyzed, on the inside he was alive and he was moving. I hope you got that this morning. He was not limited by his physical limitations. His spirit was alive. And I believe the first, the first barrier was the mental or the spiritual barrier that said, does God want to heal you? And his spirit resonated and said, yes, God wants me to be healed. Therefore, I believe I can be healed. And he overcame that barrier. Can I get an amen? The second barrier was the barrier of the crowd. The crowd was all around. It seemed like an impossible situation. Most people, when you are by yourselves and you're not carried by men of faith, carried by women of faith, carried by people of destiny, you will stop at this barrier because it seems like an impossible barrier. There's too many people. 
We can't see Jesus. The crowd is so massive. We're not going to be able to make it. But this man carried by four had the force and the power to break through this barrier. If you're going to get the miracle that God has for you, there will be obstacles. And you've got to break through these barriers. And the second barrier was the barrier of the crowd. The physical limitations. Oh, Pastor Scott, I can't because. And you fill in the blank. Oh, Pastor Scott, I believe God wants me to do this, but. And you fill in the blank of your excuses or your doubts. Every miracle has got barriers. And the second barrier that this man overcame with the help of his friends was the barrier of the crowd. Are you still with me? Say amen. The third barrier was another physical barrier. They got to the house, and it was so crowded that they had to go to the roof, and they had to dig through the roof. I want you to look in that scripture that I read in Mark chapter 2. The Bible says they were digging. Everyone say digging. They were sawing. They were, there was physical work. There was a barrier. They could have got to this place, and they could have said, oh, well, you know, we tried. I mean, I mean, we got here, and now here we are, and, and, and I guess we just had to go back home and give up. No, but these four men, these four women were women of faith, women with voices of destiny and purpose. And they said, we have come this far. We are not giving up. Let's go to the roof, and let's dig through. I think we miss out on our miracles sometimes because we're unwilling to work. Faith without works is dead. And you're only a few feet away from your miracle, but you're unwilling to work, you're unwilling to dig, you're unwilling to fight, and what a shame for you to be so close to your miracle that you give up because you're unwilling to work. Now, our works do not earn us God's grace or God's forgiveness, but when you are going after your miracle, when you are going after something that you want to believe God for, it will take work. And the roof was the third obstacle in this man's life, and I'm glad that they fought through and they broke through the roof. Amen? The fourth barrier. And it's the most subtle barrier of all three, but it's the most powerful. And you'll see it there in verse six. It's the barrier of religion. Religion. Once you notice that they broke through the mental barrier. They broke through the physical barrier of the crowd. They broke through the roof as the third obstacle. But then as soon as they broke through, watch this in verse 6, there was an opposition that rose up and it was called the religion of that day. A religious spirit rose up and said, how is it possible that this man can, can forgive sins? And they started to throw out questions. They started to throw out accusations. They started to challenge Jesus in this setting. And in your life and in my life, the biggest obstacle to you walking into your destiny and your purpose and your healing, whatever God has for you, is the barrier of religion that rises up and says, God can't do that. See, religion hangs on to rules and regulations and they rise up whenever they see faith. I want you to notice in the story, Mark chapter two, the Bible says that Jesus, watch this, saw their, everyone say their, faith. He didn't say he saw his faith. It says that he saw their faith. And their faith got them through the mental obstacle. Their faith got them to the crowd obstacle. Their faith got them through the roof obstacle. And now as soon as they break through and they're just within moments of their miracle, a religious spirit rises up and says, you can't do that. That's not the way we do things. Religion hangs on to rules. And Jesus was getting ready to blow their mind. And I'm glad he does. Can I get an amen this morning? Religion and the spirit of religion will keep you, if possible, from receiving all that God has for you. Don't let a spirit of religion, 
the greatest obstacle of all, keep you from achieving and receiving all that God has for you. I'm glad this story ended with Jesus forgiving that man's sins, healing that man's body. And the Bible says that he got up, took his mat, and he walked out the door. And the people said, we have never seen it done like this ever before. What a great story. A man paralyzed, now walking, carrying his own mat. I believe that that's what God wants for you today. You can be in the high 70s like Al or in the low 30s like Barbara. It doesn't matter what age you are. God wants you to be walking, glorifying God. And from that moment on for the rest of his life, every time someone saw him, God received glory for that miracle. And I believe that every time you do great things for God, that God will ultimately get the glory for what he's done in your life because you were willing to overcome the barriers that were placed in front of you. Let me give you, how many are still with me? Say amen. amen. Let me give you now what I believe are some of the people that you need to surround yourself with. That's at the bottom of your notes. I'm gonna give you these four. Four people that you need to surround yourself with. How many are with me? Say amen. amen. I know it's kind of, kind of getting hot in here, but I'm gonna close in just a moment, so just hang on. Four wise men with voices that you need to surround yourself with. Number one, let me give them to you. I believe that you need to surround yourself with people with high ethics. Men of character. Women of character. Women of integrity. Number two, I believe you need to surround yourself with people of experience. Now, all these start with E. This took me a long time to come up with this. So I, I, need, I at least need to hear a mm or a ah or a oh, that's good, okay, on one of these four. Can we do that, Keith, in the balcony? All right, number one, thank you. Number one, people that have high character, ethics, people of, uh, of high morality, people that you can trust in with high ethics. Number two, people of experience, people that have been there, people that have, that have done it. Young people, listen to me. There are people sitting on your pew that have been there and done that. Surround yourself with people that will speak into your life and speak from experience. Why is it that when you were younger, we reject that wisdom and we need it so desperately? People of ethics, people of experience. Number, number three, people that elevate. People that elevate. People that are lifting. People that, that, that are pulling you up. People that, are, people that are lifting you up. I hope that when you come to church at Pine Castle, you feel that as a pastor, I'm lifting you up. Oh, I may step on your toes, but I'm trying to lift you up. I'm trying to get you out of that paralyzed state into that state of victory, and sometimes you just need to hear someone who's going to elevate you just a little bit. Can I get an amen? And then number four, people of encouragement. People of encouragement. I believe these four voices were the four men that carried that man to that miracle in Capernaum. People of ethics, people of high moral, people of high character, people that elevate, people that are, that are empowering and encouraging and speaking life into people. Look at your friends just for a few moments. Just let's go back and let's take a minute out and just think of some of your closest friends. Are they people of ethics? Are they people that have high morals, high character? Are they people you can trust? Are they people that have a good reputation in the community? Are they people that are encouraging you? Are they people that are lifting you up and elevating you? Are they people of experience that have been through a few battles in their life and they've come out victorious? You see, I want to surround myself with people, watch this, that are victorious in this life and have been through the battles and they've been tested and they speak from experience. People that are victorious. I don't want to surround myself with people that are waiting for us to get victorious in the sweet by and by. Oh, in the sweet by and by. When we get to heaven, oh, what a day that will be. I think that's a cop-out for a lot of people. I think we need to surround ourselves with people of experience, people that have been through the battle, people that have been victorious, and they're victorious in this life through Jesus Christ, and their victory rubs off on you. Now, these are what I call terrific voices. 
Let me give you a couple of toxic voices that you need to avoid at all costs. Can I get an amen? Amen. Toxic voices or four foolish men that you should avoid in your life. Number one, small thinkers. Small thinkers. Oh, we can't, we, we can't do this. God doesn't want you healed. There's going to be a lot of people there. We're never going to be able to get through. Oh, my gosh, there's a roof, and that roof is an inch thick. There's no way that we can get through that. Small thinkers. They're not thinking big. They're not thinking big picture. They're thinking very myopic. And, and, and those small thinkers many times are, are, are motivated by doubt. Do we have a big God that we've worshipped this morning? Can I get an amen? amen? So if we have such a big God, why do we think so small? And many times in your life and my life, we will surround ourselves with small thinkers. And if you have a small thinker carrying you on your way to your miracle, chances are you're going to get dropped. And you'll never make it. You need people that are thinking big. Number two, skeptics. Very similar to small thinkers, but they're skeptics. They always see the glass half empty instead of half full. Skeptics. Their focus is on the barriers, not on Jesus. See, I want people carrying me. Watch this. Watch this. I want people carrying me that are taller and bigger than obstacles through Jesus Christ. And they look above. I want people that are looking, watch this, above every obstacle. I don't want people that are looking down at every obstacle. I want people that have their heads lifted up and they're looking towards Christ and they're looking towards God and their eyes are fixed on Jesus. And when you have people like that that are surrounding you, these obstacles are still going to be here, but their focus is not on the obstacles. Their focus is not on the barrier. Their focus is on Jesus. Are y'all with me this morning? And when you are being carried by people like that, they will carry you through these obstacles as they bring you to Jesus. We need people that are not small thinking and skeptics. We need people that are full of faith and purpose and destiny. The third person that you got to surround, you got to be careful not to surround yourself is what I call the self-righteous. Self-righteous. It's getting back to that religious spirit. They're self-righteous, and they think that everything is through their works and their righteousness. No, I don't want people surrounding me that are self-righteous. I want people that are, that are focused on Christ, full of faith, bringing me to the miracle that God has for me. Be careful not to hang around people that are self-righteous. And just because people say a lot of religious words doesn't mean they're religious or, super, or, 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 or spiritual. They're empty words sometimes. We say them so much. Praise the Lord. Now, I, we should say praise the Lord, but you shouldn't say it every other word. And you should mean it. And not just throw out religious words to try to, see sometimes, oh, help me, Lord. I think sometimes we say things like that trying to compensate for what we do not lack internally. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise God, yada, yada, yada. And I've been in the church all my life. And nine times out of ten, people that, that, that over-spiritualize their language are making up for a, de- a deficit in their, in their spirit. If you hang around me, you'll notice I don't say praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God, every other word. I don't think Jesus spoke like that. He was full of faith. He was full of purpose and full of be, 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 be natural in your spirituality. You don't, have to, you don't have to fake it. You don't have to act. Just be you. Be you. That's who God made you to be. Oh, I'll probably get a couple emails this week. That's okay. <laughs> Show me in the Bible where Jesus said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Just a thought. 
When he spoke, it was out of relationship. My father. It wasn't religious jargon. Oh, and by the way, his biggest obstacles was religious people in the church, in the synagogues, that were great on their outward appearance, great on their costumes and their, and their elaborate worship and their elaborate words. Most times, it's compensating for an emptiness that they don't have. And then the fourth person that you and I need to uh, be careful not to surround ourselves. Uh, and by the way, these all started with S. I hope you noticed that. Small thinkers, skeptics, self-righteous, and then number four, suckers. Suckers. Joy suckers. Life suckers. Faith suckers. Every time you're around them, they are pulling and sucking the life out of you, the joy out of you, the faith out of you. If that man in Mark chapter 2 would have surrounded himself with suckers, he would have never had the faith to get to his miracle. Be careful not to surround yourself with people that are stealing the life and the joy and the purpose out of you. If you'll let them do it, they'll do it and they'll steal every ounce of faith and life out of you and you'll be empty, unable to get your miracle. Bruce, I hope you got a good song getting ready to play here because I need it. <laughs> How many have ever been around somebody who just steals the life and the joy out of you every time you're around them? Can I see your hand? Okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Keep your hands up in the balcony. Keep your hands up. Yes, they will steal it out of you. And you feel compelled to give. And you're given, and you're given, and you're given. And guess what? They'll leave you. They'll steal all that you have. And then they will drop you in a New York minute and find somebody else to steal from. Surround yourself with people that are full of faith and full of life. And when you get next to them and you leave that coffee, you leave that lunch, you leave that dinner, you leave that time of fellowship and you are inspired and energized. That's the kind of people that this guy picked. He picked people that were lifting him up, people that were encouraging him, people that didn't look at the barriers, but they saw Jesus and that man got his miracle. And if you're unwilling to cut these ties from these type of people, you'll end up paralyzed because these people will never get you to the miracle that God has for you. 